All right, if you would, turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. We're just going to uh, continue on through 2 Corinthians, where uh, Pastor Manny left off over 10 years ago and where Pastor Bob left off last week. Believe it or not, this is the section of Scripture I taught my very first Sunday as pastor here over 10 years ago. And uh, I wish I could say we've been through the whole Bible already, but... That's just not the pace that God has set us on. Uh, 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, they talk about giving, which happens to be one of the things I really don't like talking about. And uh, so, of course, uh, it was very fitting that it, it, we just happened to be there for my very first sermon as pastor, you know, right out of the gate, uh, talking about giving. God does have a sense of humor, that's for sure. And, uh, and this is why we go verse by verse and chapter by chapter and book by book. Here at Calvary Chapel, it keeps us from underemphasizing the things we don't want to talk about and overemphasizing the things we do want to talk about. We cover the whole counsel of God in the same proportion that God gave it to us in. And it's not that I don't like giving. Don't get me wrong. The ability to give is one of the greatest blessings that God has given to us. The problem is that this gift, this blessing has been so misused and so abused in the name of Christ. I guess it made me kind of hypercritical of anyone that speaks on the topic. You know, as soon as I hear the subject come up, I immediately begin to try to decipher the motives of the person speaking. You know, where's he going with this? What's this guy after? And it really stinks that we, you know, mankind, have perverted another awesome gift that God has given us. And let me assure you, my motive here is strictly to teach God's word simply and plainly. Uh, this ministry, it continues on. God has provided for us over the past 10 years. He'll continue to provide for us as we follow his leading. Obviously, most recently, he's provided a building for us to call our very own. Uh, if you recall, Paul is writing to the church in Corinth. And uh, as he's traveling on this missionary journey, he's taking up a collection for the church in Jerusalem, for the people in Jerusalem, who were in an economic crisis. Paul starts chapter 8 by telling them about the church in Macedonia and how even though they were suffering great affliction and they were deep in poverty, they gave. Not only according to their ability, but Paul says beyond their ability. Paul mentions how they gave of their own accord. And they even begged for the opportunity to participate in supporting the saints or the believers in Jesus there in Jerusalem. Paul mentions how this was unexpected and more importantly, how they had first given themselves to the Lord. You see, when we realize that we are dead in our sins and we realize that what God has done for us, that Jesus died to save us and we surrender our lives to Jesus Christ, we're saying, God, you saved my life. So my life now belongs to you. Like we see in history, you know, when a man is saved by another, the saved man devotes his life to serving the other. You see, when we are truly surrendered to Christ, we're not giving of our own time. We're not giving of our own abilities. We're not giving of our own finances. These things are no longer ours to give. They belong to him. He's our Lord. He's our master. We're just stewards of these things. So really, the only decision we get to make is whether or not we're going to do what our Lord wants us to do. Are we going to be good and faithful servants, daily following the Lord's leading concerning the use of this time and these abilities and these resources that God has entrusted us with? Or are we going to be our own boss? Are we going to be our own master? Are we going to be our own Lord? God forbid, we say. Yet none of us are strangers to living our lives under our own direction at times, are we? Well, I mean, not us, but people at other churches, right? That's one of my favorite pastors always says. Paul charges the Corinthians, as well as us, to abound in this gracious work of giving just as they abound in the other gifts of the Spirit. And we're going to pick up and uh, back up a little bit to verse 8. I say this not as a command, 
but to prove by the earnestness of others that your love also is genuine. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. Paul says, this isn't a command, but an opportunity to prove your love for others in Christ. Then he uses Jesus as an example of proper giving. You know, we can't even fathom the heights, the glory, the splendor that Christ traded for the lows and the shame and the squalor. He assumed our debt of sin and paid for it with his perfect, innocent life. Paul says, is, it a, is a material offering too much to ask? Don't misunderstand. The work of Christ can never be paid for. It can never be bought. We can't pay God back for what he's done for us. All we can do is surrender our lives to him and then follow his leading with these lives that now belong to him. Verse 10 says, And in this matter I give my judgment. This benefits you who a year ago started not only to do this work, but also to desire to do it. So now finish doing it as well, so that your readiness in desiring it may be matched by your, by your completing it out of what you have. Paul says you started this a year ago by your own desire. Fulfill what you intended to do. You know, a, a friend, an old friend of mine used to say, Good intentions and a quarter will get you a cup of coffee. I guess that's been quite a while. Now, nowadays, I guess we would say good intentions and five bucks will get you a grande skinny boy decaf latte no foam. Right? <laughs> or whatever your favorite drink is. The, the point being, although God sees our hearts and our intentions, and I'm sure God appreciates it, but without follow through, what good is it? It would have been better for these Corinthians to say nothing at all than to commit to something and then not do it. It makes them look like a bunch of liars or deceivers or, or at best flakes, right? James tells us in chapter 2, verse 14, What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed, and lacking in daily food. And one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things they need for the body? What good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. James is in no way saying that we are saved by works. He is saying that the evidence of a true faith will be seen in our works. You know, if I told you, that the building was on fire. And you said, oh, yeah, I, I believe it. But you all just sat here and didn't leave the building. You said you believed, but your actions or your lack thereof revealed what you really believed. You really didn't believe the building was on fire. Your actions reveal your true heart. The best way to tell what kind of tree you have is to look at the fruit that's growing on it, right? Verse 12 of 1 Corinthians chapter 8. For if the readiness is there, it is acceptable according to what a person has, not according to what he does not have. For I do not mean that others should be eased and you burdened, but that as a matter of fairness, your abundance at the present time should supply their need so that their abundance may supply your need, that there may be a fairness. As it is written, whoever gathered much has nothing left over, and whoever gathered little had no lack. It's our willingness to give. It's not the amount that counts. Don't wait until you have more time to serve. Don't wait until you have more ability to volunteer. Don't wait to be in a better financial situation to give, because you'll never have enough time. You'll never be good enough. You'll never have enough money. It's your willingness to give. It's not the amount. Paul says, while you have the opportunity to give, do it. And when you're in need, someone else will be in the position to give to you. This equality that Paul is speaking of, it should not be confused with communism or socialism, which may seem notable in theory, but in practice... It always, 
they end up becoming absolute tyrannies, forcing people to share at gunpoint. That's not what Paul's talking about. Paul uses this quote from Exodus to make his point. He says, everyone gathered what they could, some more and some less, but they all shared what they had gathered voluntarily. Verse 16 says, But thanks be to God who put into the heart of Titus the same earnest care I have for you. For he not only accepted our appeal, But being himself very earnest, he is going to you of his own accord. With him we are sending the brother who is famous among all the churches for his preaching of the gospel. And not only that, but he has been appointed by the churches to travel with us as we carry out this act of grace that is being ministered by us for the glory of the Lord himself and to show our goodwill. Verse 20. We take this course so that no one should blame us about this generous gift that is being administered by us. For we aim at what is honorable, not only in the Lord's sight, but also in the sight of man. And when them, and with them we are sending our brother whom we have often tested and found earnest in many matters, but who is now more earnest than ever because of this great confidence in you. Verse 23. As for Titus, he is my partner and fellow worker for your benefit. And as for our brothers, they are messengers of the churches, the glory of Christ. So give proof before the churches of your love and of our boasting about you to these men. Paul informs them that Titus can be trusted to hold their money. We don't know the name of this other brother. We just know that he was well-known. He's famous for the things of the gospel among the churches. And he's been appointed by the churches for this task. Paul is demonstrating that all things financial in in the church should be conducted properly and above reproach. Paul took the necessary steps so that no one could blame him with financial misconduct. We, too, have systems of checks and balances here at place at Calvary Chapel to ensure the finances are handled properly and above reproach. Paul implores them, again, to put their money where their mouth is, to show the evidence of their love. Chapter 9, verse 1, Paul writes, Now it is superfluous for me to write to you about the ministry of the saints, For I know your readiness, of which I boast about you to the people of Macedonia, saying that Achaia has been ready since last year, and your zeal has stirred up most of them. Paul is basically saying that he doesn't even need to write, because this he knows they were ready and willing to give. However, if they were ready and willing to give, I don't think he would have had to write this. So Paul reminds them again how they were ready a year ago and how their willingness and their zeal had inspired these other churches to be generous in this work of grace. Verse 3 says, But I am sending the brothers so that our boasting about you may not prove empty in this matter, so that you may be ready, as I said you would be. Otherwise, if some Macedonians come with me and find that you are not ready, we would be humiliated to say nothing of you, for being so confident. So I thought it necessary to urge the brothers to go on ahead of you to you and arrange in advance for the gift you have promised so that it may be ready as a willing gift, not as an exaction. Paul is, he's starting to sweat here. It seems like he's been bragging about how generous these Corinthians are. However, they actually haven't given anything yet except good intentions. And we know what good intentions will get you, right? I don't think a cup of coffee is going to suffice the church in Jerusalem here. He's really worried and he's, that he's going to show up and they won't have anything ready for this collection they've been promising. So Paul says that he's sending these guys ahead so when he gets there, they won't, they won't have to deal with it. These guys will de- take care of it. Paul is very careful how he handles the finances, not wanting to bring reproach on the name of Christ. Unfortunately, we've all seen men that do bring reproach to our Lord's name by the way they mishandle money and by the way they mishandle God's word about money. Here, we don't cry poor from the pulpit. 
trying to pull on your heartstrings to guilt you into giving. And the reason is, we're not looking to you to supply for my ministry. We're looking to the Lord to supply the needs for his ministry. Remember, when God guides, God always provides. Pastor Chuck says, I always look a little ensconced at these who have been led by God into some great program, and yet the whole thing's going to fail unless you bail God out. I somehow don't conceive God as being on the brink of bankruptcy every other week and ready to fold his whole program because people don't come through and rescue him from financial insolvency. You may be thinking, well, isn't Paul asking for money for the church in Jerusalem? Yes, he is, but remember, the word church does not mean a building or a ministry like it's so often used today. Church is the word used to describe believers in Jesus. We are part of the church that meets here in Stockbridge, Georgia. And actually, we're just part of the part of the church that meets here in Stockbridge. The guys down the street are part of the church. Anybody that's a believer in Jesus is part of the church. So Paul's not collecting money for the rent on a building there. He's collecting for personal needs of the believers there in Jerusalem. So like Paul, you may hear us mention the needs of a person and present the opportunity to help them from time to time, like we just did this morning. Verse 6 says, the point is this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Paul uses this physical example to illustrate a spiritual law. The illustration is a man spreading seed on the ground, and I immediately think of my own yard, and you all, I'm sure you know what I'm talking about, this Georgia red clay. It's not the best soil to try to grow grass in. I really gave up on that battle years ago. If it's green and it grows, it's welcome to stay in my yard. You know, the, the definition of the word weed, it means a plant in the wrong place. So my yard has no weeds. <laughs> Any plant is better than raw dirt, the way I look at it. But just picture your yard, okay? And you've got the soil prepared. It's all tilled up with the fertilizers and the lime, and you got it all smoothed out. It's ready. You've got this big area of prepared soil, so you go into the garage and you got several big 50 pound bags of grass seed and it's expensive. So you decide, well, hey, I'm just going to put out, you know, a little bit, a little handful and see what happens. So you take out one, one handful and very frugally, you know, maybe with a pinch, throw it out in the yard, spread it out really thin. What's the harvest going to look like? At best, at the absolute best, you will get one tiny grass plant for every seed you put out, right? So you end up with this big field of dirt with a few tiny hairs of grass. Not exactly somewhere you want to lay down on a hot summer day. Not inviting for a picnic. If you look at the directions, it tells you to put so many pounds of seed per square foot of prepared soil using the proper spreading device set at the proper setting. But doing this way, it takes some time, doesn't it? It takes some calculating. It takes some effort. There's a cost involved. But what's the result? You should end up with a nice, thick, beautiful green lawn. That's the way the sod farms do it. Many of us, we just pay them to do all the work, right? And then we move the grass to our yard. You see, it's a very simple concept that Paul uses to illustrate this spiritual law of giving that is spoken of throughout Scripture. You may ask, well, how, how does this work? I don't know. I mean, how does gravity work? If you step off the edge of your roof, you and the ground are going to meet up real quickly. Why does gravity work that way? Why does a mass of matter create this pull? I don't know. That God designed it that way. How does this law of giving work, the spiritual law? I don't know the mechanics of it, but it just does. And many of us here will, can testify to it. The fact is, it's the only law that God challenges us to prove. In Malachi 3, chapter 10 God says, bring the full tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open up the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. Now, that's quite a promise from God, isn't it? However, don't misunderstand what God is saying here. This is not some get-rich-quick scheme. It's not some 
moving on up plan to outdo your friends and neighbors with more expensive firewood, as Daniel calls it. <laughs> Remember, God's going to burn it all up in the end anyway. It doesn't matter what emblems on your chunk of steel that you drive. It's all going to burn in the end. This promise from God is not even a retirement plan. It's not God's version of the 401k. However, it could be called a post-retirement plan. You know, the chapter of life after you retire. You've heard it said that you can't take your money with you, but you can send it on ahead. And we're promised to reap a bountiful harvest of blessing. And it, and it, can, it can be both material and it can, it's certainly going to be spiritual. We have two examples here. In Philippians chapter 4, Paul says, I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied, having received from Epiphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. And my God will supply every need of yours according to the riches and glory in Christ Jesus. So here we have a promise of God to meet the physical needs to the generously hearted Philippians. And then in Matthew 19, we read, Then Peter said in reply to Jesus, See, we have left everything and followed you. What then will we have? Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, in the new world, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And to everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or lands for my name's sake will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life but many who are first will be last and the last first here jesus promises spiritual blessings for here and so we have blessings for here and now we have blessings for eternity for those that gave up things for jesus's name's sake Back to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Paul says, Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. God says each one, so we're all called to be givers. He says, as he has purposed in his heart. The motivation for giving should come from our hearts. We should give because we want to give. It should never be coerced or manipulated the way we use the resources entrusted to us reveals the purposes within our hearts jesus put it simply for where your treasure is there your heart will be also god says through paul not grudgingly or under compulsion and this is why we don't pass a plate here and i'm not saying it's wrong to pass a plate it just presents the possibility of someone feeling pressured to give when they don't want to give. And to help with that, many churches use envelopes so the amount is concealed and, and to help relieve some of that pressure that can occur when a person, you know, next to you, let's say the guy next to you places a stack of $20 bills on the plate and he's handing it to you, looking at you, and you've got, you know, two singles in your hand. It can put some undue pressure on you. And uh, you could pressure you to give more than God is directing you to give. So envelopes, are, they're a great idea. We have envelopes available next to the offering box. And I'm, well, I'm sure we'll put them in the seat backs when we get over in the new building, uh, just for convenience. But we just want to err on the safe side and let your giving totally betwe be between you and God. And that's why we have that offering box or the electronic giving. Have you ever been given something and then the person that gives it complains about you accepting it? Or someone offers to help you move and then complains the whole time while they're there? I mean, what a horrible feeling, isn't it? You know, it just, if, you, if the person didn't want to give, then why did they offer? You know, maybe they're saying, well, I was just being polite, you know, good manners. We we're always taught to share. But, you know, if you had any manners, you wouldn't have accepted it. And it's just crazy. What a ridiculous game we play sometimes, isn't it? If you don't want to share something, just own it, you know. It's better to be selfish than to be selfish and a liar, you know. 
We don't want to put that kind of thing on God. We don't want to put that foolishness on him. If you can't give cheerfully, then just keep it. You're better off, seriously. He continues in verse 8, And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. As it is written, he has distributed freely, he has given to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. God rewards our giving in many different physical and spiritual ways. Sure, sometimes a check shows up in the mailbox or cash or whatever, but God may provide a promotion at work, a pay raise, an unexpected gift. Sometimes it's the opposite. He, he causes things to last longer so they don't need to be replaced. We see that with the children of Israel, right? For 40 years, their, their clothes lasted, their shoes. Maybe your tires are lasting longer than they should be lasting. Uh, maybe your bills will go down. God is very creative in the way he supplies our needs. Spiritually, God blesses us by freeing our hearts from materialism, by giving us a sense of joy and happiness, and by storing up for us a reward in heaven. Paul says, having all sufficiency or all contentment in all things. What an awesome place for us to be, to be totally content in all things that we may have abundance for every good deed. We are blessed so that we can be a blessing to others. He doesn't bless us to store it. He blesses us to pass it on. We're not supposed to be warehouses. God made us to be distribution centers for his resources. He continues in verse 10. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for the food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. For the ministry of this service is not only supplying the needs of the saints, but is also overflowing in many thanksgivings to God. Is anyone familiar with the television show Downton Abbey? Anybody ever seen that? A few of us? You have? Okay. Uh, Jill watches it. I've seen it a few times. And it's very interesting. It's, a, it's about a wealthy estate in England during the early 1900s. And so this huge estate. The family of the estate lives upstairs. All the servants of the estate live downstairs. And there's all kinds of different servants with all different talents and abilities. They're all given different resources to use in order to accomplish the tasks that they've been assigned to do by the master of the house, who they call Lord Grantham. They call him Lord. That was the title they used back there in England. So like the courier delivers supplies purchased with the master's money, the cook prepares the meals with the master's food, the butlers and maids, they serve the dinner to the family, they serve them the master's meals. They all sleep in the master's house, they wear the clothes the master supplies, Nothing in the estate belongs to them. They are not owners, but stewards of the master's resources. Carson, the butler, who is like the head of all the male servants, he said, a good servant at all times retains a sense of pride and dignity that represents the pride and dignity of the family he serves. He feels that the servants are representative of the master's house. It's very interesting, earlier in 2 Corinthians, in chapter 5, we kind of, Paul tells us a similar type of thing. In verse 18, all this is from God, and through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors or representatives of, for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. We are ambassadors or representatives of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Master. And whether we like it or not, which I don't like it, <laughs> but people are making judgments about Jesus based on us. Because we represent him to the world. You know, I, I say, hey, look at Jesus. Look at the word. 
But they don't. They look at us. It would be so much better if they could look right at the real thing, right? But they're looking at us. Uh, at best, we're not the best, we're not the great representatives always. But that's just how it is. In another episode of this show, this cousin Matthew moves into the guest house, I guess. I don't know all the details, but he's, he's not used to having so many servants around. He's got a few servants, but so he, now he has this, they call him a valet, this personal manservant. And, and his job is to help the man get dressed. And uh, Matthew's more than capable in dressing himself like the rest of us, right? And uh, so he deprives this servant Mosby the opportunity to do the task that's been given to him by the master. And so he's just very, it's a very awkward situation for the servant can't do what the master's called him to do because this other guy's like, I can just do this myself. And uh, it made me think I'm certainly guilty of that. And often, uh, quite often, it's easier just to do some things myself but sometimes it results in depriving someone else from doing the task that God has called them to do or assigned to them. And I will try to be more mindful of that in the future with you all. And the reason I mention this show is that it just reminded me of the Christian life. You see, when, we're, when we realize that we're dead in our sin, when we realize what God has done for us, that Jesus died to save us, and we surrender ourselves to Christ, we're saying, God, you saved my life, so my life belongs to you, Lord. When we are truly surrendered to Christ, we're not giving of our own time. We're not giving of our own abilities. We're not giving of our own finances. These things are no longer ours to give. They don't belong to us. They belong to him. They belong to Jesus. He is our Lord. Jesus is our master. We're just stewards of these things. We're servants of his. Again, the only decision we get to make is whether or not we're going to do what our Lord Jesus wants us to do. Are we going to be good and faithful servants, daily following the Lord's leading, conserving the use of this time that he has given us, these abilities he's given us, these resources that God has entrusted us with? And so be an accurate, accurate representative, representative of our Lord? Or are we going to be our own boss? Are we going to be our own master? Are we going to be our own Lord? And then be an inaccurate representative of Jesus. Instead, we'd be an accurate representative of our sinful nature, I guess, of the, of the world, of the enemy. We certainly don't want to represent that, do we? He continues in verse 12, <clears throat> for the ministry of this service is not only supplying the needs of the saints, but it is also overflowing in many thanksgivings to God. By their approval of this service, they will glorify God because of your submission that comes from your confession of the gospel of Christ and the generosity of your contribution for them and for all others, while they long for you and pray for you. Because of the surpassing grace of God upon you, thanks be to God for his inexpressible gift. By God meeting the needs of others through us, through his servants, God gets glorified and thanked. Prayers and petitions to God by others are answered by God through his obedient servants. God answers prayers through us. And then the people give thanks to God for answering that prayer. God gets glorified. The faith of the people, it increases, right? They just saw God work in their lives. And we, his servants, get to play a part in it. And how awesome is that? And then Paul says prayers are given for the servants of God. Uh, because often the, the person answering the prayer, they see the servants, they see God working through us, and they lift us up in prayer. What a blessing that is. So Paul closes by thanking God for his indescri indescribable gift, which is eternal salvation through Jesus Christ. We should follow God's example 
we should follow his motivation for giving to others. It's the most famous verse in the Bible. We all know it. But let's just look at the first half. For God so loved the world that he gave. God's motivation for giving, the greatest gift ever, is love. Agape love. It's not to get anything. It's not to get rewards in heaven. It's not anything. His motivation is just love. And agape love, that should be our motivation as well. Not warm, fuzzy, feeling love. You know, the English language really does us a disservice by grouping four different Greek words for love into one word. Unconditional agape love. The word is agape and that God uses in, uh, for God so loved the world. And God defines that agape love for us in 1 Corinthians 13. And I just put the Greek word in there. Agape, this is what it means. Agape is patient and kind. Agape does not envy or boast. It's not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. Oh, I'll, I'll help, but we're going to do it my way, right? It's not irritable or resentful. Yeah, I'll do it, God, but I'm not happy about it. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Agape bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Agape never ends. For God so agape the world that he gave. That's the most incredible gift ever. So let's follow his example. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for being our God. We thank you for using us, for allowing us to be your servants and your representatives, Lord, and for supplying our needs and for supplying us with more, Lord, to, to meet others' needs at times. And so, Father, I just, help, I just ask that you would help each one of us, Lord, to be in tune to what you're calling each one of us to do. Lord, we're all servants, but we are, Lord, you have many different activities, opportunities for each and every one of us. Lord, you use us in all different and incredible ways. And so, Lord, I would just ask that you would help each one of us to really tune into you, to really hear the way that you would have us serve you each and every day, Lord. That we'd be, we would be listening to you, our master. And that we would be doing with our, the resources that you've given us, Lord, that you've given us charge over with our time, with our talents, with the resources, Lord, that we would be using them in the way you desire to use us. They're your resources, Lord. We're your servants. Lord, be with us this week. Open our eyes to you more and more every day, Lord, that we would grow closer to you, that we would see you for greater and greater each and every day, Father. In Jesus' precious name we pray, amen.